Hello, I'm Janet Morana, the Executive Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to our program. Well, as you know, we have a program called Defending Life, which airs currently on EWTN. If you'd like to see the schedule, just go to EWTN.com. But what I've done is I've gone bar back into our archives, looking at some powerful shows from the past to show them to you now. Well, today's show features Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Now, Dr. Nathanson, of course, has, has passed away several years ago, uh, but he was the architect, the founder, basically, of the whole abortion industry. Dr. Nathanson performed abortions uh, in New York, New York City, that's where he was from. He owned a, an abortion clinic there. But he, along with other colleagues, basically got abortion started. And abortion actually was legal in New York State prior to Roe v. Wade. It was New York, California, Hawaii, and several states had abortion legal before Roe v. Wade. Uh, and Dr. Nathanson tells us how they got away with it. How did they imagine that they would make abortion legal? What was their scheme, their plots, how they went about it? So let's take a look at that program right now. He was a key architect of the abortion industry and next on Defending Life, you'll hear him explain the single most important element, both of his success and of ours. Hello, I'm Janet Morena, Executive Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to our Defending Life program. I'm joined here today by one of our priest associates, Father Scott Daniels. Father, welcome to our program. Thank you, Janet. Well, Father, as always, we like to begin our programs with prayer, and we have pro-life reflections for every day, of course, written by Father Pavone and available to our viewers at Priests for Life. They can contact us if they'd like to receive a copy. Today's reflection comes from 2 Corinthians. Such is the complete confidence in God that we have through Christ. Our confidence comes from God who has empowered us. The same Holy Spirit who created the universe descended upon the womb of Mary, came as tongues of fire at Pentecost, and leads the church on her mission, is the one who calls and equips us for our pro-life work. Let us not lack for a moment the confidence and joy that come from him and impel us to build a culture of life. Let us pray. <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit, and equip us, just as you equipped disciples of every century to advance the gospel of life. Amen. Amen. And people can also get those daily reflections at ProLifeReflections.com on the web, that website where every day there'll be a new reflection for them. Great for your iPads and your iPhones. Well, Father, today we have to talk about someone who basically was the architect of the abortion industry, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who passed away a few years ago. And, uh, you know, he was responsible for over 75,000 abortions. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Even aborting his own child. Imagine that. And actually, one of the women, actually a few of them, but one in particular I can mention is Mary Kaminsky, uh, who speaks for Silent No More. Mm -hmm. She talks about when she was a teenager, she was underage, she lived in New Jersey, but the, the clinic told her to, they sent her over to New York to Dr. Nathanson's clinic because abortion was only legal because this was before 73, was only legal in New York and California at the time. They sent her, you know, without parental consent, underage, over to New York, and she had her abortion in Dr. Nathanson's clinic. So, like I said, he was the architect of, of this whole thing, helped get it started. And the miraculous thing is he had a conversion, as we know. And uh, We'll talk more about that, but let's first turn and listen to some of Dr. Nathanson's words, all right? In the late 60s, when we organized NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, uh, most of our activity and our activism 
were predicated or premised on the fact, which we knew, that the clergy was not vigilant, was virtually sleeping, not literally, but figuratively sleeping on this subject, that they could not envision such a revolution, a social revolution, as uh, legalizing abortion. Now, we took great advantage of that. We made capital of that because uh, once the clergy were caught napping uh, and we moved ahead of them, then by the time the clergy, principally the Catholic clergy, woke up to the fact that we were miles ahead of them, it was Roe v. Wade time, and suddenly abortion was legal. Well, clearly the first and most important priority is education. If the priests, the clergy, are adequately educated to these issues, they will then become alerted to them. They will be, they, the, the sleep will be broken, as it were, and they will come out in front as leaders of the community in terms of trying to, to supply the very difficult answers to these complex questions. But the first thing that the clergy must do is educate itself to these matters, such as genetic manipulation and engineering, assisted reproductive technology, euthanasia, uh, aging, all of these things. They are complex issues, but they are, they are manageable in ordinary terms. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or a physician to understand much, most, if not all, of the genetics involved. It's pretty simple. And uh, I, myself, I'm a physician, but I, of course I hated genetics in college, but, but I nevertheless have applied myself to the point where I think I'm reasonably comfortable in that area. Well, you don't have to be a physician to do that. You can be a priest or uh, a, a lawyer, and many lawyers are very competent in this area, or accountant or anything else. But the main thing is education, and intense education at that. Priests for Life is a extraordinarily fine group, uh, and I, I don't say that in order to um, make anybody feel better or flatter anyone. Uh, it's, an, it's an unusual and a very unique group in that most of the priests whom I have encountered across this country and indeed around the world uh, shy away from the subject of abortion. They somehow want to keep it under the rug and only pull it out when they're re ordered to. Uh, in my own experience as a Catholic convert for the last several years, um, I've attended a great many masses and listened to a great many homilies, and I think, believe in three years I've listened only to one homily on the subject of abortion, and that was here in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Other than that, priests seem not to want to talk about it. And Priests for Life is the Paul Revere of this whole gestalt that priests for life are riding around trying to galvanize the rest of the clergy into getting engaged in what is one of the most appalling revolutions of the 20th century. And I am uh, enormously grateful to them and admire their work enormously, but unfortunately I believe that there are not enough, that priests for life should, be, should have a staff 20 times what it has now. Well, he has quite a story, and you know, his conversion, uh, when he began that journey, uh, Father Pavone and I were at a Human Life International conference. It was back in April of 1994, and actually Father Frank was moderating the panel by which Dr. Nathanson was giving a talk. Mm -hmm. His talk was supposed to be about RU486. Well, when he got to the microphone, he said, oh, that's not what I'm speaking about today, and he poured out his oh. heart to us that he was on the verge and the brink of conversion. Now, he was originally a non-believer at all, didn't believe in God mm. at all, and now he was on the brink of conversion. And he said, oh, if, I, I just wish, you know, I don't know if God can forgive me, though. 
And Father Frank, of course, he was the moderator. You know, Dr. said, I hope God can forgive me. And Father Pavone said, he already has. Yes. He already yeah. has forgiven you. And at that moment, the audience leapt in the air. And I always remember Dr. Alice von Hildebrand. She's tiny, about mm -hmm. a little bit over five foot. She leaped up in the air. You could see her almost hit the ceiling, which she <laughs> seemed like. And the whole group just began in spontaneous prayer. They prayed the Our Father, the Hail Mary for him. And of course, his journey continued on, culminating with uh, Cardinal uh, John O'Connor, receiving him into the Catholic Church and baptizing uh, him into the church. And, and actually, uh, just moments, a uh, few days before his death, uh, Father Pavone uh, went to see him and he reminded him of that experience and it smiled. And he said, it, and he turned to Father and he said, how's, how's the troops, how's the movement mm -hmm. going, you know? Yeah. And just tell them to keep, keep, keep forging ahead. So he was a great inspiration. Well, we have more to look at about Dr. Nathanson. Right after this break, we're gonna come back and watch a few more Dr. Nathanson's words. So stay with us. Not until people saw images of children in coal mines did they enact child labor laws. Not until people saw images of human torture did they rise up against slavery? And now, after seeing these images, what will you do? Priests for life, because America will never reject abortion unless America sees abortion. Call now to learn how you can help. You are looking at the face of an unborn child 25 and a half weeks into pregnancy. This child can be legally killed by abortion in America. As this ad from the Yellow Pages proves, some abortion clinics sell abortions up to 28 weeks. Abortion kills living children whose hearts are beating and whose bodily organs are all in place. Abortion, haven't we gone too far? Welcome back to our Defending Life program. We're talking today about Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Well, Father, that was a very powerful uh, words of what Dr. Nathanson said. Indeed, Janet, and I have to tell you as a priest, I found it very frightening because he admits, being a pioneer and an architect of the abortion industry, he says, uh, most of our activity, activism, were predicated, premised on the fact that the clergy were asleep. That's right. And he says, particularly the Catholic clergy. He says, by the time they woke up or, or began to wake up, he said, well, Roe v. Wade was at the threshold. It was there. Right. It's frightening, uh, yeah. Janet. I mean, his exact words were, if the clergy had been united, purposeful, and strong. Right. I mean, those are his exact words. And he, he's really right. You know, he is. And, you know, he was a, a basically advanced thinker. I can remember back when uh, we first spoke to him about different things, all the way back in, in, 19, in the 90s, he was talking about stem cell. He was talking about the bioethical engineering. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a clip of some of uh, the things he said back then. So let's take a look to see how, what an advanced thinker he was and how he was trying to prevent happening to us what's going on now, what he did with the abortion industry. So let's take a that look at that sure. clip. The problem in assisted reproductive technology is that it is turning upside down all of our relationships to each other. Um, for example, there is egg donation and sperm donation and then surrogate mothers and uh, embryo transplants and frozen embryos. The absurdity of this comes up in a case in California in which a trial judge had an eight-year-old girl appear before him. A couple who wanted a baby commissioned, uh, the woman could not carry a child and the man had weak sperm, they commissioned uh, the assisted reproductive technologist to mix somebody else's sperm, a sperm donor, with somebody else's egg. They paid for it. They created an embryo. The embryo was put in the womb of a surrogate mother and she delivered the baby nine months later. Then the question arose as to who were the parents. And just about the time the question arose, the original couple who paid for all this filed for divorce. So the question became, was the original couple the parents of this child? Or were, was the sperm donor and his wife the parent? 
or the egg donor and her husband the parent, or the surrogate mother and her husband the, the parent. The judge concluded there were eight parents, literally, biologically, but the child had no parents and was placed in a foster home. I mean, it, 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 the permutations and combinations of this kind of technology are staggering. Dignity is uh, something which I spent a good deal of time on since I wrote my dissertation in bioethics on it. But um, basically, it's very simple, and it's not a complex issue at all. Dignity resides in what is called imago dei. I mean, I've explored all the other sources of dignity. And in general, people confuse the appearance of dignity with dignity itself. Uh, dignity is intrinsic within the human being. It is given to us by God. It is untouchable. You cannot have your dignity taken away or enhanced or reduced. The appearance of dignity, yes, or respect for dignity, yes. Those things are changeable, but the dignity itself is not. You know, he was sounding the alarm all the way back then about the language and things. You know, I can remember him saying, uh, even when he would meet sometimes with Father Pavone and myself, that, you know, we really have to get on top of this stem cell before the other side commands the language on us. And, you know, he had that, that advanced thinking like that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the man's brilliant. And, of course, we attribute to God's grace his conversion. But, you know, the thing is he can't emphasize enough the need for the clergy to be educated, not just about abortion. He also says that should include genetic engineering, manipulation, aging, uh, assisted reproduction technology, and euthanasia. That's right. Well, we need to pray for Dr. Nathanson, as always, as, as good Catholics. That's what we need to do. Have, say masses, have masses said for the repose of his soul. Certainly. And uh, may he rest in peace. You Indeed. Know? Well, Father, when we come back, we'll have to another segment, viewers. We're going to come back and answer some questions that you, our viewers, have sent to us, and we're going to give you further action you can do to help bring more of a cultural life to your community. Stay tuned. What can you do to save lives from abortion? Our most heavily promoted brochure is designed to answer that question. It's called, You Can Save Someone's Life Today, and it brings you practical resources and effective strategies to end abortion. This flyer has been completely revised and updated and offers some key statistics and talking points about abortion. It equips you to connect with alternatives to abortion, healing after abortion, pro-life spirituality, and social networking. This flyer gives an overview of how people can be involved in our family of ministries and projects and is ideal as a parish bulletin insert or handout at pro-life events. Contact Priest for Life for You Can Save Someone's Life today by calling our toll-free number 888-735-3448 or visit our online store, priestforlife.org slash store. Thank you. Welcome back to our Defending Life program, where now we're going to answer one of the questions that you, our viewers, have sent in to us at Priest for Life. Well, Father Scott, today's question comes from Carlos from Miami, Florida, and he writes, how can I encourage my priest to preach on abortion? Mm -hmm. Carlos, thank you for your question. It addresses, of course, one of the key missions of Priest for Life, to encourage our clergy to speak, teach, and mobilize people more effectively to end abortion. First of all, talk to your priest about it or to someone who can talk to him about it. Find out what his concerns are, if any. Find out what his key interests are and show him how those topics are linked to the theme of pro-life. Also, make sure he is receiving the Priest for Life homily hints, which are available through email or at www.priestforlife.org liturgy. Share with your priest the post-abortion testimonies that are available through our Silent No More awareness campaign. Many of those testimonies speak about how if these mothers had heard about abortion from the pulpit, they would not have aborted their children. You can also encourage your priest by giving him our booklet, Addressing Abortion with Confidence, which directly answers more than 20 common concerns or fears that priests have about preaching on this topic. We will be happy to send you this booklet today free of charge. 
So thank you for your question, uh, Carlos. Friends, any time that any of you have a question or comment, please go to askfatherfrank.com and our team will respond to you. Thank you. Well, Father, thank you, you know, and as we know with the clergy, we have other resources too. For example, we have a clergy email where we send them, like you were saying, homily mm -hmm. hands. Well, we have it so that like every Friday it goes out, but it's giving them homily hands, bulletin inserts, and also the uh, prayers of the faithful, but based on the readings three weeks ahead. So for the priests that are watching right now, please contact Priests for Life. Give us your email. We'd like to right. get you on that clergy email because it's very handy. You get it by email. Of course. And even for seminarians, I know there are quite a few seminarians that are subscribing to it because when they're taking their class on homiletics, it's very helpful. Exactly. And we also have it for the all mm -hmm. three cycles, ABC cycles. So they should contact us for that. Well, I receive uh, the, from the, the liturgy uh, section of Priests for Life uh, website every week. Plus, I already know I access it every week when I'm preparing for a homily. Right. So it's a wonderful resource. And then, of course, another resource is that we have our pastoral team of priests who are willing to come to the parish. So, for example, yourself, uh, Father Frank Pavone, of course, Father Dennis Wilde, and Father Victor Salomon. I think nothing encourages priests more to preach about abortion than one of our priests comes in. They preach at all the masses, and Father's in a very safe position because this way he can kind of sit back and kind of watch, see the reaction of the people, which you can test testify to father it's wonderful isn't it they're saying oh father why don't we hear about this more so it gives that priest that encouragement to say okay i can do that I, I heard father scott I, I can do what he did right and of course when i travel i, I normally stay in rectory so we have very in-depth conversations about the pro-life movement what's going on and they're interested to talk and to find out more about right. it right so we uh, want to invite you know, ask our, our viewers to invite our priest mm -hmm. to come to their parish and do a parish weekend because that's the best way to encourage your priest. And I guarantee you, once one of our priests has left your parish, mm -hmm. you're going to hear a lot more preaching on abortion. And in offering this invitation to maximize the visit, find us some Catholic high schools and find us some elementary schools and other venues where we can preach the pro-life message. While you're there. Well, another way of getting out the pro-life message, Father, is our action uh, segment right now. Mm -hmm which is to mm. use pro-life license plates. Now, I know right here where we are at EWTN filming these programs, that parking lot, their employees <laughs> are full with the, what they call the Choose Life license plate, which they have here in Alabama. It's growing all the time, the different states that it's being added to. My state, New Jersey, uh, has just added the pro-life license plates. And they have to understand that the money that you pay for those license plates is also being funneled back into the pregnancy centers. So it, it's really a, a life-giving activity. Now, for those states who do not have the Choose Life yet, you can order vanity plates with pro-life messages. Mm -hmm. Like, I know our Priest for Life vehicles uh, at the office, you know, we have, what do they say, Father? Pro-life. Pro-life, Choose Life, yes. Right, but we have, like, Pro-life 1, Pro-life 6. Oh, you mean the actual yes, plates? Oh, plates. of course, Because yes. in New York, they, they don't have right. the Choose Life. Mm -hmm. So if your state doesn't have it yet, you can order vanity plates with a pro-life message. So there's more than one way to get that pro-life message out. And, you know, uh, I mean, I can tell you so many times people will see that and they give you, they honk the horn, you get the thumbs up. So it, it really does make a difference when people see. I think we encourage each other. We don't feel so alone in our pro-life work. Exactly. Visuals are always important, John. That's right. Well, Father, I want to thank you again. And, you know, remembering Dr. Nathanson, I think, is very inspiring because that should encourage all our viewers. If you have someone in your family that's on the other side, adamantly pro-choice, look how Dr. Nathanson was converted from being an abortion doctor, right. the founder of the movement, to a believer and become a Catholic. So this can happen to anyone. Don't lose heart, don't lose faith, and keep, keep bringing the message to them in right. love and kindness. Well, I have a motto, Janet, God will never be outdone. That's right. Well, thank you for joining us on our program again this week. I'd like to remind you that you can contact Priest for Life also to continue prayers by obtaining our mass cards, both for the living and deceased. And then tune in again next week for another episode of Defending Life. Thank you and God bless. The major burning questions, which are just beyond the horizon, I've been talking about them, as you know, publicly for some years now. I've tried to raise the consciousness of the public as well as the priests themselves, but that's a big assignment, and uh, 
I don't know how successful I've been, but God will let me know in the end. Wasn't that powerful? What insight Dr. Nathanson had. Anyway, um, you saw on that show too, we were offering our mass cards for the living and deceased and some other things. You can just go to our online store to order those items at prolifeproducts.org. Remember the quote Dr. Nathanson said that they would never have gotten away with, with what they did to start abortion if the church, the clergy had been united purposeful and strong. Now maybe you're thinking, how can we get the clergy to speak more about abortion? I've got a great resource for you. It's a beautiful book written by Father Frank Pavone called Proclaiming the Message of Life. This would make a great gift for your priests or deacons, any clergy, because in this book, what Father Pavone has done, he's taken the Sunday readings in the A cycle, B cycle, and C cycle, and shows how you can take those readings from the scriptures, from the gospel, and give a life-affirming message. You see, if people are going to walk away from abortion and all these technologies, it's got to, you got to spoon feed them little by little. It's not just one homily a year on abortion that's going to change hearts and minds. So this book could be a powerful resource for you to give as a gift. Again, proclaiming the message of life. Also in this book are a few chapters where Father Frank writes, why clergy shy away from preaching on abortion. It really helps them get more comfortable with the issue and dispels some of the myths and fears they have. So again, Proclaiming the Message of Life, you can order it today at our online store at prolifeproducts.org. Thank you and God bless.